sleep studies. You have two basic types of sleep studies. You have a lab-based sleep study, either called in-lab study or PSG, polysomnogram. They wire people up all over the place. Many more channels of information, much more well-controlled, but many patients never sleep during their in-lab study. So your results are not valid. When I had my first sleep study, um, I was given an AHI of essentially zero because I never went to sleep. But when I really go to sleep, I have measurable apnea. The home studies have many fewer channels, a lot less information, it's less controlled, but your study itself may be more valid because the patient is actually getting real sleep. And the results vary. If the AHI you get from a home study may be very different from what you get from a sleep study because a sleep study is going to be reviewed by a technician and he's going to look at the graph and go, I know the computer didn't score that as an apnea or hypopnea or rara, but it should be. So the home sleep studies, and it'll either be called out of center sleep test or home sleep test, not as much information, but if you get one that includes raras, often more indicative of the patient's true sleep pattern. Um, original and follow-up studies must be the same or well correlated by the sleep physician. Here's how they measure Arrera. Your study has to have a respiratory effort belt, and there are two different types. And the airflow has to be measured. So at the time that the patient is trying to breathe in, as indicated by stretching of the belt, they need to see that the waveform of the inspired air, instead of being a nice peak, becomes flat-topped. They're breathing in, they're breathing in, and then they're struggling to breathe in, but the airflow essentially levels out, and then the expiratory, the expiratory phase is about three times that of the inspiratory phrase, phase. And I'll have a graph on that later, but basically, Arrera is not measurable with these studies. Arrera, they take this information and everyone has their own algorithm for defining ARERA. And for someone in a sleep study, they're going to see a desaturation of at least 1%, or they may define it as 2% in their study. At the same time, the person's trying to breathe in, and the waveform of the inspired air is more level at the top. It's called flattening out. Um, and those three criteria are used, and they'll grade that as ARERA. Very few sleep monitors can do that. They can't actually measure it. It's all how they define it and then create, oh, this must have been a rara. The problem being that you have a certain subgroup of patients that have a negligible apnea hypopnea index. It's 2, 3, 0.9, but they're getting 12 raras per hour, and these are not picked up on most studies, they're not picked up on your home monitors. So you think, oh great, my AHI is way below five, but your patient is still struggling to breathe, and you haven't corrected their problem. So if you're gonna buy a sleep monitor, you need one in which they can pull the data and say this is a rara. And the uh, I'm buying one of the new Respironics when it comes out in two weeks. We can tweak the programming to define RARAs. The uh, Apnea Link Plus is a less expensive monitor. Their algorithm will define RARAs for you. It's not really accurate, and it's not going to be as accurate as your sleep study would do, but at least it's something to work towards. So make sure that, and the problem with most of these uh, monitors that say, we'll define a RERA for you, is you don't know how they're defining a RERA. Your sleep study, your sleep center may define a RERA as a, all the stuff going on and oxygen desaturates by 1%. Another one may say it has to you know, desaturate by 2%. The other ones say, oh, that doesn't matter. It's the waveform of the inspiration and that it flattens out. So most of the companies will not tell you how they're defining ARERA, so it's tricky. But at least if you're getting something they call ARERA from a reputable company.
It'll help. Polysomnogram in lab, full night, you get more REM. When you have the sleep study done, you want it a full night, not a split night, because your REM sleep doesn't occur until later in the night. If they do a split night study, says, say, oh, the person has apnea, and then wakes them up, starts titrating CPAP, you have no idea what their REM apnea index is, and that's incredibly important, and you, you lose the ability to treat properly. So with a full night sleep, tell people you'd rather a full night sleep, not split night, you get more apneas and hypopneas, it's more accurate. One of the things you need your studies, both at home and in lab, to pick up is positional versus non-positional obstructive sleep apnea. The, the definition of positional apnea is that the AHI doubles when they're on their back. But their AHI may not double when they're on their back, but it's a lot worse, so it's still relative positional apnea. And sometimes, if they have no apnea when they're on their side, or on their right side, or on their left side, um, and all their apneas occur when they're on their back in supine, then your treatment for that patient may be one of the things I'll show you later to keep them from sleeping on their back, and that may be the most effective thing you can give that patient, and you're not making a lot of money, they're not paying a lot of money, but you say go out and buy this, don't sleep on your back, have another sleep study, find your problems resolved, you don't need a sleep appliance. Um, one of the, um, so if they've got positional um, sleep apnea, the treatment is handle the position. One of the things to be aware of in a PSG is it's usually done on their back. So the wires don't fall off, they don't knock things loose, and it, it maximizes the AHI. They're in the position they're gonna be apneic most. So if you wanna minimize the AHI, Avoid sleeping on the back. Try the right side, try the left side. Um, you remember that you need enough sleep, full night study for REM, for a full uh, diagnosis, and you need at least 80% sleep efficiency, that they're asleep during that time, so you've got enough sleep to measure. Most sleep centers do their sleep studies on the back. Again, so the wires don't dislodge, but also because on the back they get a higher AHI, they get to prescribe CPAP, and everyone's happy because they're making money. But many of your patients don't sleep on their back. A lot of pilots, airline pilots, um, maritime pilots, and truck drivers now are being required to take sleep studies. And the, um, the point is that when they have these sleep studies done, they're on their back. And I had one patient who swore he did not have sleep apnea. During his sleep study, he had significant apnea. And when I questioned him about it, he said, I don't sleep on my back, and that's when it occurs. But in the sleep study, they made me sleep on my back. So here's a guy that law was about to lose his license, his profession, because he didn't sleep on his back, but when he had a sleep study done, they made him sleep on his back, had apnea, and all he needed was positional therapy to assure the boards, whoever they be, that he did not sleep on his back, didn't have an issue. So if you get someone that comes in and says, I don't have apnea, Everyone will tell you that, but look at the sleep study. If all the apneas are supine and he's got almost none when he's not on his back, that patient may not need anything except not sleeping on the back. And don't let your patients get caught in this. You will be a hero if someone comes in, they're about to lose their license to fly, drive, something, and you can say, look, the way the sleep study was done, change that, have another sleep study, and you can move on in life. Out-of-center sleep studies. Um, it's either called OCST, out-of-center sleep test, or HST. You'll see it both ways, so don't get thrown when you see it. You need oxygen saturation, pulse, airflow, breath sounds, respiratory effort. This is where you'll help pick up your RARAs, so get one with a belt, use one with the belt. EMG studies, um, movement, Position, very important, because this is where you'll pick up your supine apnea and apneas, hypopneas, and raras. So you can get an AHI, an RDI, 
and your rarers show up. Um, out of center sleep devices, you'll get maybe six channels, eight channels. You want to make sure you can get oxygen saturation, pulse, airflow, respiratory effort, time spent under 90% oxygen saturation, your full oxygen saturation, and your minimum of six channels. Your goal, and we'll get to this later, is that you want to have the patient spend as little time as possible with their oxygen saturation, which should ideally be 100%, but in most sleep folks, 98%, 97%, you want to have as little time below 90% as possible. One of the criteria for successful treatment is they have less than 1% of their sleep time spent with their oxygen saturation under 90%. So that 1% becomes an important criteria. When you're looking at a sleep study, you'll want to go to your sleep lab and have them review some sleep studies with you so you know what you're looking at. If you look at this study, it's very positional um, sleep apnea. Uh, the supine AHI is 113 events per hour, but your total AHI is much lower. So what that tells you is sleep therapy is important. Very poor sleep efficiency, no deep sleep or REM, mostly hypopneas, and your periodic limb movement index is elevated, which is going to be decreasing sleep because they're going to arouse from that. When you get a sleep study back that either you've run or you're getting back from your referring physician, you want to sit down with your patient, let them know you understand this, that you're looking out for them. You want the total number of apneas and hypopneas per hour. And obviously the total number and then the AHI, how many per hour. You also want to discuss if you can get an RDI, uh, an RDI then it says how many RERAs per hour to discuss with them, hey, you're not stopping breathing there, but you're working awfully hard to breathe there, and that's also a problem for you. Number of desaturations, how many times they deprive their bottom of sleep, their body of sleep. And this is what they tend to understand. You know, if your AHI is 17, that's how many times per hour, not only did you stop breathing, your brain and body did not have enough oxygen. And you're having a lot of changes in the body from that high blood pressure, um, things that lead to stroke. And, and, and go over that, how many times they deprive their body of oxygen per hour how long each event was where they weren't breathing. You'd be surprised when these people realize that they may have stopped breathing for 40 seconds or 30 seconds. It starts then to become real. The longest event, you'll often find someone that has sleep apnea they're not aware of that has stopped breathing for 40 seconds and ask them, stop breathing for 40 seconds and see how you feel. Again, it becomes real how low their oxygen saturation went, their PSO2, and the percentage of time they spent with not enough oxygen in the body. The goals of appliance therapy are to reduce your AHI by half. To get your AHI under 10, but ideally under 5, so into, you're into the normal range. If you've got someone with an AHI of 30, you can get it under 10, that's successful. But it's really wonderful you can get it under five and you can say, hey, now you're in the normal range. Um, minimize the time with blood saturation under 90%, hopefully zero, but definitely no more than 1%. Your oxygen saturation, therefore, is above 90% or 90% or greater for 99% of the time. They've eliminated snoring, gasping, and apneas. And then there are other goals that are variable per patient. I want to be able to camp without worrying about breathing. I want to be able to sleep next to my wife. One of the worst things for me when I was not treating myself properly is that I would snore very loudly. I'd wake up and my wife would be sleeping in the next room. That kills me. It really, really ruins my day to wake up and not be next to my wife and to find out she had to go sleep in another room. And that may be the biggest thing that you've eliminated the snoring for that patient. But don't get tricked into treating only the snoring. I'll repeat it several times, that when you put a patient in one of these appliances, the snoring is eliminated prior to the apnea. 
being, being eliminated. So you will turn a noisy apneic who you can tell is not breathing at points to a silent apneic in which it si sounds like everything is great and that is absolutely deadly. Those people die. So never treat to snoring unless they've had a sleep study and snoring is the only issue.